very thankful to the ADL because if it wasn't for the ADL, no way would I have gotten to New Mexico uh, and uh, a couple other states uh, that I spoke for only for ADL, so thank you for that. Um, and we've gotten to see a lot of America and uh, the beauty of your country and mine um, and the challenges that you're facing and uh, the challenges that Israel and America are facing together. And uh, I appreciate the ADL hasn't told me not to speak about anything. We're not shying away. Or maybe I forgot to ask. <laughs> We're not shying away from anything tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about everything going on, for better or for worse. Um, in Israel, we're not so good at sports. In Israel, our national pastime is politics. Uh, and I get a front row seat to watch the politics as it happens from my office in the Knesset. I, I get to be there for a lot of excitement. I get to watch history and tell people around the world as it happens, which is a wonderful opportunity. Um, and so the political system in Israel is a little bit more complicated than it is here in America. We have only two messed up political parties. <laughs> in Israel, we have 30. <laughs> we have everything from a pirate party that's in favor of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Nice idea to a men's rights party, more needed than ever, <laughs> to a green leaf party that believes the way to solve the Middle East conflict is to legalize marijuana and distribute it throughout the region for free, <laughs> which is possibly the only thing that hasn't been tried when it comes to making peace in the Middle East. And maybe that's the answer. We don't know. And so the political system uh, we had 10 parties that made it in, which is a record low, which makes it pretty hard to get anything done. The reason why we have this crazy political system is that the founders of Israel had different fears in mind than the founders of America. The founders of America were afraid of tyranny, right? So they formed a system of government with checks and balances between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches in case there might be a president one day who might try to take too much power. You never know. <laughs> when that might happen. The founders of Israel were afraid of something else. They were afraid of disenfranchisement. Jews have been minorities around the world for 1,878 years. So we formed a system of government whose goal was to empower our minorities. This is an event of the ADL. We believe in empowering our minorities and, and sticking up for them. Um, and uh, we get that from the, from the courage of, of Moses and uh, Abraham way back when. And so, in Arab parties, the third largest party in Israel today. Uh, they have it Bedouins and Christians and Muslims and Druves. And lots of times they say things that the consensus in Israel doesn't like. But we will forever protect their right to say it. Um, they're not the only minorities. We have uh, an Ethiopian <coughs> member of Knesset who walked here as a child from a village with no running water and now has a doctorate and heads the Committee on Absorbing Immigrants in the Parliament. And we have two out of the closet gay members of Knesset. Not sure how many total gay members of Knesset. A and we have a record number of women, 33, which is still a long way to go out of 120. But uh, we're doing better than the Senate and the House in the United States, right? And uh, some of you will remember better than me that we had a female head of state uh, back in the 1960s in Golda and America still working on catching up to us on that one day. And we also have in Israel more female judges than male judges in the country and in my house. <laughs> so with this many parties and everything and no one party ever getting a majority of the vote, how do we get anything done? The answer is we don't. Uh, I mean, look, uh, we could get things done if we had a majority of the room agree on something. Uh, but. I'll tell you a secret. Jews are argumentative people. This is where someone usually shouts out, no, we're not. You're very polite here. No, maybe it's because it's an ADL event and they think I'm saying something anti-Semitic. 
<laughs> so, um, look, I, I found a couple things that we agree on. We agree, uh, the politicians all agree on a couple things that Israel doesn't have enough of. Um, when I asked a, a birthright group not too long ago, what, what do we not have enough of in Israel? Someone shouted out from the back, Jews. <laughs> And I said, okay, that's the point of birthright. Go make some tonight. <laughs> and I think that the counselor didn't like that idea very much. I'm not sure I'm getting invited back to that <laughs> provider. Um, but look, one thing is not a Jewish thing. It's a people thing. We'd all like to have more money. The economy is actually something that unites Israelis, basically. We all agree uh, that the cost of living is a bit too high. The gaps between rich and poor are, are way too wide. We have the third largest gap between rich and poor out of any Western nation after Mexico and the country just to the north of Mexico. That's a problem, and they pretty much agree on how to solve it. The, the jobs are in the center of the country, poorer people, poorer sectors live in the north and the south, and so we used to bring, build factories in the north and the south for those people. They were not economically viable, the factories, they closed down, and now they're in China. Uh, instead, Israel decided to build high-speed roads and trains to get the people into the center of the country to get those jobs. And that's worked out very well. That's resulted in us having the lowest unemployment rate out of any Western nation. Except that it's a lie. Because it does not include those who are not seeking work. Including the ultra-Orthodox men. Ultra-Orthodox are 10% of the population, so 5% of the population, um, uh, only half of them have jobs. And the rest are learning Torah full-time. and. <laughs> not seeking work. So the unemployment rate is not real. Then again, it, the people not seeking work in America are not included either. Um, so on, on the economy, they pretty much agree. Uh, the other thing that we agree uh, that we do not have enough of in Israel is security. Living in a region like this. You don't have to squint if you're in the back. The yellow countries are the ones that don't like us, okay? Just the yellow ones. That's all. Um, and so uh, well, all we have is that little sliver the size of New Jersey. And so let me get you up to date uh, on the positive and negative developments going on in this region. Uh, but because we're Jewish, I'll start with a negative. <laughs> if I'm going to start with a negative, uh, I'll start with ISIS, right? So ISIS still controls a portion of the border between Israel and Syria. People tell you that they are on the way to being defeated, but it's still going to take time. And the fact that ISIS can still inspire horrible, horrible acts uh, so close to here in New York, it's so sad. Um, and uh, Israel shows solidarity uh, with the people of New York. Uh, just like we showed solidarity with the people of Barcelona and, and the people where all the other terrorist attacks were uh, around the world. Unfortunately, they learned. Uh, the terrorist groups, they try things on Israel and then they implement them uh, in other places too. Um, and so just like America, Israel won't stop until that terror is defeated. Um, and so in Israel though, We've managed for the most part to stay out of the fighting going on in Syria. We've said all along that our only real involvement was treating wounded people in our hospitals. About 5,000 of them we treated, uh, which is very nice. Uh, hopefully made us look good around the world if people knew about it. Um, people usually arrived unconscious, have no idea where they were. And when they were told they were in Israel, they were in shock. Did you bring me here to kill me? Am I a hostage? No, we saved your life. That wasn't our only involvement going on in Syria. There have been more than 100 Israeli airstrikes during the Syrian civil war in order to make sure that weapons that could threaten us aren't brought there, in order to make sure that Iran does not gain a foothold. Uh, Arab television networks reported an Israeli strike in Homs today. So, you know, we've been there making sure that we're not going to end up being the loser of the, of the Syrian civil war. And Iran will not end up being the victor. And so there's a lot of diplomatic activity going on right now to ensure that as well. Vladimir Putin is in Iran right now. And uh, 
I'm sure that there will be conversations afterward with Netanyahu to clarify what, why is he in Iran right now. Netanyahu and Putin talk all the time. They spoke a week and a half ago at length. Um, the Russian defense minister was in Israel two weeks ago. Uh, Netanyahu sent his national security advisor to Washington and Moscow a week ago. It's constant. The vice president of the United States is coming to Israel in Hanukkah. Uh, and so Netanyahu is uh, leaving right now to London. Also, we'll be speaking about Iran and Syria in order to make sure that things go as close as possible to making things safe in the region. Um, it's a challenge because we've got Russia right there now on our border and they're not going away. They're going to be there forever. When I spoke about the challenges of having Russia on our border a year and a half ago in Alaska, they kind of laughed at me. They said, what's the big deal? We see Russia from our window. <laughs> but it is very serious because, you know, we used to have air superiority everywhere in this region. It takes a few seconds to fly an F-16 to another country when you live in such a small country. We used to be able to fly without concern. Now we have Russia on our border, a self-proclaimed superpower. And they have to know every time we fly a plane in the air. Um, we've avoided confrontation so far, thank God. Now, there is a, a positive. There is a positive, uh, which is the uh, Russians have told Hezbollah that they cannot be attacking us, which is very important because Hezbollah is the most immediate strategic threat to Israel today. They have 130,000 missiles and rockets aimed at Israel today. 130,000. To put that number into perspective, we fought a war against them a dozen years ago, which ended with a UN brokered ceasefire in which the United Nations promised, they said, we will make sure that there are no rockets and missiles aimed at Israel from Lebanon, not one. There are now more rockets and missiles aimed at Israel from Lebanon than there are in any country in the world, aimed at any country in the world. Thank you, UN. You're a very effective organization. But the positives are that the Hezbollah have been deterred. They've been deterred by the war we had with them. They've been deterred by the Russians telling them they can't fire anything. They've been deterred by the fighting going on in Syria where they lost 1,700 of their top fighters to the point where they're not in a position to be attacking us anytime soon. And they've also been deterred by Iran. Iran gave them their missiles and rockets to use as a retaliation if someone would attack Iran. And I don't think anybody's about to attack Iran with anything but credit cards. European countries fighting with each other over who can do more business with Iran. Leaving at the door the morality that they show whenever it comes to Israel. We Israelis were against that deal that the world reached with Iran. 85% of Israelis were against the deal, which for me as a political analyst was fascinating. I've never seen 85% of Israelis unite on anything before, <coughs> other than maybe falafel. <laughs> and I'd like to think that out of those 85%, 100% of them hope they're wrong. They hope they're wrong in their belief that that deal will facilitate a nuclear Iran rather than prevent one. They hope that President Obama was right, that it will prevent a nuclear Iran rather than facilitate one. And now we're trying to change it. Uh, Netanyahu believes that he can persuade the world to change it. Um, Netanyahu went to the United Nations General Assembly and said, fix it or nix it, which is a very nice rhyme. But the headline wasn't uh, nix it. He's been saying that all along. The headline was fix it. What Netanyahu was doing was helping Trump climb down the tall tree that he climbed during the campaign. Uh, where he said, this deal is horrible, it's the worst deal signed between any human beings who ever walked the earth, uh, and it has to be torn up, and he realized he can't tear it up. So Netanyahu, by saying, just fix it, was making it kosher for Trump to keep the deal uh, and just work on the, the most problematic parts of it, which are the sunset clauses, which would result in Iran getting 100 bombs in about eight years, and the lack of inspections that would facilitate them getting those bombs, inspections that haven't been taking place since the deal was signed. So that's where the focus is right now with that. But there are a couple of positives that have come out of the Iran deal. Number one is temporary quiet, in part because of the, uh, the uh, deal and, and Iran 
telling its proxies, the terrorist groups that it controls throughout the region to keep things calm while the money's flowing in. This, the strategic situation for Israel, this chief of staff of the IDF recently said, has never been better. Which is quite a statement to make. You know someone's telling the truth if they say something that's not so good for their budget. Tell your friends, this is the safest time ever to come visit Israel. I see a, a, a big poster out there on a, a synagogue trip, uh, interfaith, even better, uh, to come and, and see the country. If you've never been, uh, this is the time to go. Tell your uh, children and grandchildren. Um, never been safer. And I wouldn't recommend going to New York. <laughs> but Israel's safe. It's terrible. Um, the other positive, I can tell you, as a formerly long-suffering sports fan, I can say that sometimes when you lose, you get closer to your teammates along the way. Israel fought against that deal and did not emerge successful, maybe crossed some red lines even in the process, but along the way became closer to the other countries who opposed it, to the Saudis, to the Emirates, to Egypt. We have a really good relationship with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia now. It's changing a lot of things, which is the key to uh, making peace in the Middle East. That's why Jared Kushner uh, just went there again. And we have uh, probably a better relationship with Sisi in Egypt than we've had with any regime in Egypt since Joseph, <laughs> going all the way back. We appreciate what Sisi has done to stop the rearming of the Hamas in Gaza, making a war with them again anytime soon, not likely. Uh, the Hamas are totally isolated. The different countries that were supporting them, Turkey, uh, Iran, Qatar, not happening anymore. They're alone to the point that just today, they gave up control over the crossings from Gaza into Israel and from Gaza into Egypt, which makes the entire region more safe. The crossings between Egypt into Gaza was how they smuggled weapons in, in the past and tunnels underground, which have been made into fish ponds, which is a nice idea. Uh, that on the border between Israel and Gaza, they, they made terror tunnels and there, Israel has technology for stopping them and detecting them. And that's why Israel destroyed one a uh, couple days ago. And they said they would retaliate. They have not. They can't. They are weaker than ever, which makes Israel even safer. And so look, they've tried everything. They tried to defeat Israel from Gaza with rockets and mortars and terror tunnels, and they failed. They tried to defeat Israel on the other side with shootings and stabbings and car rammings, and they failed. They tried to defeat Israel with suicide bombers, with conventional warfare, with chemical warfare, and they failed. They tried to put Israel on trial around the world. They've sent flotillas and flytillas and every kind of tilla and failed. And they've tried to defeat Israel with boycotts and divestment and sanctions, and they're failing pathetically. Netanyahu recently briefed the staff of the Jerusalem Post. And he took one look at us and pointed his finger and he said, you're getting it all wrong. Could you believe it? A politician telling journalists that they're getting things wrong? Where does that happen? Uh, and so Netanyahu said, you're focusing on the wrong three letters, on B, D, and S. He said the real trend in international diplomacy is actually three different letters, TNT. What does TNT stand for, Mr. Prime Minister? He said, he's meeting with more world leaders than ever. Um, he's, uh, in the last year and a half alone, been invited to uh, East Africa, West Africa, Latin America, Australia, Singapore, Muslim countries like Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. Um, you know, uh, America a few times, Moscow a few times, throughout Europe, London today again. He said whenever he meets with world leaders, it usually lasts uh, an hour and a half to maybe two hours. The first minute they ask about the Palestinians, put a, a check mark on the pa piece of paper in front of them, and then they talk about what they really want to talk about. Uh, technology. They want to learn from Israel how it became the startup nation uh, and what they can do in their countries. The N stands for natural gas. 
We thought all along that Moses made a wrong turn and took us to the only place in the Middle East without oil. Uh, turns out we have natural resources too. The other T stands for? A couple nights ago, the group said it, they thought it stood for Torah. No. Adorable, but no. <laughs> How about terror? Unfortunately. The, the world wants to learn from Israel the experience in fighting terror. Um, I'm sorry that we're the leaders when it comes to that. I wish we weren't. Uh, but uh, leaders around the world want to learn from Israel how to do that better. Uh, and uh, Israel is making the world safer. I'm sure uh, providing information to the NYPD today, giving them advice, uh, just like we've helped the people in France and, and uh, everywhere else. Um, that's what they want to hear about. And uh, look, uh, we hope uh, that uh, just like we help the Palestinian Authority in fighting terror, uh, and we coordinate with them, that we can start soon in talking to them again about how to achieve peace. That's the goal. Uh, we're very much in favor of it. We're waiting for them to come back to the table. But Netanyahu says that peacemaking in the Middle East is different than other places around the world. He says that unlike in other places, in the Middle East it takes three to tango. You have to have the right kind of leadership not making mistakes among the Israelis, the Palestinians, and America. Well, let's think about who's in that dance. You've got an American president who, uh, let's use a non-controversial word, who's divisive. And we have a Palestinian leader who's an expert in missing opportunities and who's not well. And we have an Israeli leader who uh, at any given point the police could recommend indicting him. That's an interesting dance, isn't it? Let's think about it. So first of all, we'll start out with Netanyahu. Netanyahu is on top of the world. He's being invited everywhere, has the respect of the world, probably uh, the uh, second most respected Israeli in the world after Gal Gadot, <laughs> Wonder Woman. Um, no politician can bring him down. There's no serious competition for him politically right now. The only politician who could end his career is himself. His own hedonism uh, that has led to these criminal investigations, his own hubris. Uh, let's explain the investigations, because I found that, that American Jews don't really get them, especially the first one. The biggest investigation that everyone talks about is the expensive gift affair, uh, where Netanyahu has been accused of uh, receiving a lot of cigars, pink champagne, and uh, jewelry for his wife uh, from a rich Hollywood producer. Don't worry, not that one. <laughs> from Arnon Milchin, the man who uh, made the shidduch between Brad and Angelina which lasted a long time by Hollywood standards. Um, American Jews don't see what the big deal is. After all, your president receives a lot of gifts. When he was in Saudi Arabia, he received 50 gifts from the Saudis, including matching bathrobes for him and Melania made out of the fur of a cheetah. They had to actually catch two cheetahs, run, run very fast. Uh, to uh, make these bathrobes. Netanyahu doesn't have anything made out of cheetah fur. He's just received a lot of cigars over the years, which adds up uh, over time uh, from this billionaire. And if he in return helped him sell a television station in Israel that wasn't worth anything for a lot of money, that's called a bribe. Um, Netanyahu at first denied that he received that many cigars. And when he did, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Every time I've interviewed Netanyahu, he smoked cigars the entire time. The last time I interviewed Netanyahu, as I was approaching my house, my wife came out on the porch and said, I smell you. <laughs> You're not going into the building smelling like that. Strip now. Out here? In front of everybody? Yeah, you stink. You'll make the entire building stink if you go in smelling like that. She ended up throwing down clothes for me. 
uh, and telling me to go change, shower and change my clothes at my mother's <laughs> and bring my clothes to the cleaners and, and then come back. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> so Netanyahu can't deny the cigars. The second investigation is the newspaper collusion affair. When Netanyahu was prime minister in the 90s, there was no pro-Netanyahu media outlet. Netanyahu said, I need a fox. It's hard to form a TV station. He formed a newspaper. He got his friend Sheldon Adelson, rich Republican from Las Vegas, to start a newspaper in Israel, which is given out free. Israelis like free. Uh, and it became the largest circulation newspaper in Israel very quickly. It's a pro-Netanyahu paper, which is fine. But then Netanyahu continued. He tried to get the second largest circulation newspaper in Israel, which is very anti him, to become less anti him in return for having Sheldon's paper come out less. That's also a bribe. The third investigation is the submarine affair, where Netanyahu purchased very expensive, apparently unnecessary submarines from a German company that employed his cousin slash lawyer slash the man who's controlled all of his finances from the moment he entered politics more than 20 years ago. And so uh, that is a very serious investigation. Currently, he is not a suspect. But if anyone can find out for sure that he knew, uh, then that could be a very serious problem for him. And, and it's already a serious problem that you have a prime minister who has to think about these cases all the time. When Netanyahu convenes the security cabinet, at any given point, an aide comes in, hands him a little note that says, uh, there was a, a report on the nightly news uh, that the uh, police leaked this or that about your investigation. He has to leave the room where they're deciding whether to attack in Syria in order to call his lawyer about how to respond. It goes the other way too. The last time Netanyahu was questioned by police in his investigations, he received a little note from one of his advisors all of a sudden saying, the President of the United States is on the phone. And Netanyahu had to ask the police to be able to leave the room to take the call. I've tried that too. <laughs> uh, when uh, stopped by police for speeding or whatever it was, I to tell them, I I've got a very important phone call. Uh, Trump's on the phone probably won't help very much. Uh, but. Now, what was strange was Netanyahu told the police, I'll be right back. <laughs> True story. He forgot who the President of the United States is. Trump doesn't speak briefly. <laughs> so uh, he had to leave for a while. And I don't think that police uh, like that very much. So these things are, are going on right now all at the same time. And it makes it pretty hard to function as a prime minister. And we, and we don't know if he's going to last forever or have the police take him down. And it could very well be that if he is taken down, this diplomatic renaissance that we have, this security renaissance we have, it's better than ever security-wise. It's better than ever diplomacy-wise for Israel. Could end up uh, vanishing when he goes. After all, people said all along that the world will stop talking to us if there's no peace process. There hasn't been a peace process for four years, and the world is talking to us more than ever. Um, but we want there to be a peace process. Whenever we've had a peace process, there has been one of three things. There's either been an Arab leader who Israelis trust, an American leader who Israelis revere or desire in the Israeli part to withdraw unilaterally. You could think about whether we have any one of those three things right now. A desire in the Israeli part to withdraw unilaterally. I was there in Gaza wearing an IDF uniform when we withdrew 8,000 Jews from their homes. It was very painful. Since then, we've had 20,000 rockets fired at Israeli civilians. And because of that, I don't expect to see a desire in the Israeli part to withdraw unilaterally anytime soon. An Arab leader who Israelis trust. Well, the, well, let's get back to that dance. In that dance, you have Abbas. Abbas uh, has had plenty of chances to make peace with us. Best chance being in September 2008, the Prime Minister of Israel was Ehud Olmert. He offered him 100% of the West Bank with land swaps, 100%. He offered to take in thousands of Palestinian refugees into the final borders of the state of Israel alongside a Palestinian state with unlimited refugees. And he offered to divide Jerusalem, a heart and soul. The Arab neighborhoods would have become the capital of a Palestinian state. 
the old city would have been internationalized under the control of five countries, the United States, the new Palestinian state, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. That was the offer that our prime minister made back in September 2008 that Abbas turned down. Abbas is their leader. He was elected in January 2005 to a four-year term. He is now in his 13th year of that four-year term. That doesn't sound so democratic to me. He's 82 years old, and you probably know a lot of young people in their 80s. He's not among them. He's a chain-smoking for decades kind of 80-year-old. His time is limited. His party has already chosen a successor whose name is Abu Jihad, which does not bode very well. So that kind, because there's no Arab leader who even wants to talk to us publicly anyway, that leaves us with the American president who Israelis revere. Hmm. Before we start talking about the current president, let's take a step back. When I grew up in Chicago, I didn't know whether I lived in a red state or a blue state. People didn't talk about those things back then. And now, everybody knows what color state they live in. The people who live in blue states don't like the people who live in red states. The people who live in red states don't like the people who live in blue states. Everybody's jealous of the people in the purple states especially in Florida. Now I've seen America be more divided than ever, and it's very sad. I'd like to think Israel's gone in the opposite direction. I remember coming to Israel in a gap year program between high school and college from 95 to 96. We had three prime ministers that year, remarking in Israel tonight, uh, the anniversary uh, coming up of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. <coughs> So the, the ceremonies uh, were held today. Um, after him, uh, Shimon Peres was the prime minister, then Netanyahu, the election between them. Everybody thought if the other guy wins, we're all going to die. And everybody had a bumper sticker on their car telling people who they were voting for. We had an election two years ago. I didn't see a single bumper sticker on any car. And it's not just because of the Facebookization of politics. It's really because Israelis have become uh, more chill, more relaxed, less political, less intense, while America has gone the other way. Israelis still don't understand American politics. Israelis have liked and hated both Democratic and Republican presidents. Israelis loved Bill Clinton. Israelis loved George Bush W even though they had exact opposite approaches about how to solve the Middle East conflict, right? Bush had his very hands-off approach to how to solve the Middle East conflict, didn't come to Israel his first seven years as president of the United States. A lot of Israelis liked that. Clinton had his very hands-on approach to how to solve the Middle East conflict, especially when it came to Jewish women. <laughs> so have most presidents, if you want to put everybody on trial now. Uh, and this, uh, the reason I, why I've been telling the same joke for 20 years, and it's wonderful that a joke can last that long, is really just to emphasize it, it's not a Democrat Republican thing. That is, even though Israelis did not like Barack Obama, that would not mean that they would not like another Democratic president. Uh, the reason why Israelis did not like Barack Obama, even though we appreciate what he did for our security, is that. He overthrew a moderate leader in Egypt, causing chaos throughout the region, set a red line in Syria on chemical weapons and allowed it to be crossed, uh, resulting in the loss of American credibility throughout the region, a lot of needless death, made a deal with Iran behind the backs of Israel and other American allies, persuading everyone in the region that there's no point in being an ally of America. And every step that he took on the Israeli-Palestinian issue made it harder to achieve peace during his tenure and for the foreseeable future. That was why Israelis did not like Obama. But uh, that does not mean they, that they would not have liked Hillary. Uh, Netanyahu was very careful during the campaign, never said anything during the election after getting in trouble in the past. But I got an impression from speaking to him personally that he thought Hillary would win. She sort of did. At one point I asked him, 
have you read Hillary's book? And he said to me, yes, and I liked it. What did Hillary write in her book? She wrote, I advised Obama to have very different policies on Israel and the Palestinians, but I got overruled. Who could overrule the Secretary of State in advising the President on foreign policy? She wrote, the Chief of Staff at the time, Rahm Emanuel, my mayor in Chicago, the man who can't stop crime, or LeBron James, the two evils plaguing Chicago in recent years. Uh, Rahm's advice. Um, and uh, I think we're a mature enough crowd that I can give the exact quote, with all due respect. His advice to Obama was the following sentence. Netanyahu's fucking ketchup, squeeze him and you get out what you want. Was that good advice in retrospect, ladies and gentlemen? Not so much. Hillary's advice was, don't focus too much on settlements, because if you do, there won't be a peace process. Was that good advice? Let's think about it. Eight years of having a policy of not one brick anywhere over the pre-67 border. A uh, very big change from the policies of uh, Clinton and Bush before. That policy was suspended for nine months when John Kerry took over as Secretary of State and said, I don't think that policy is helpful. Started a peace process that lasted for nine months that was then destroyed at the end of the nine months by Obama focusing on settlements again. But during those nine months, America said they turn a blind eye to Israeli construction. Those were the only nine months that there was a peace process during the Obama administration. Proving, once again, that settlements are not an obstacle to peace, but people making a really big deal about whether a Jew lives here or a Jew lives there is an obstacle to peace. And uh, that's not just during those eight years, 20, 30 years, look back. Um, and so Hillary's advice, in, in retrospect, was very good, and we have no idea what things would be looking like right now had she uh, taken office. Uh, I'm probably the only Israeli journalist who has interviewed both Hillary and Trump. My interview with Donald Trump was in 2013 when he put out a video in politics in Israel, which was seen as a strange thing to do. He has no business in Israel. There's nothing named after him <laughs> in Israel yet. And so he put out a video in the Israeli election in which he endorsed Netanyahu. And so that day, his staff put me in touch with him so he could explain why he put out the video. And Trump told me on the phone, I love BB. I love his personality. I love his policies. I wish Netanyahu could be the next president of the United States. <laughs> That's what he told me four years ago. Imagine. I tried reminding his people a couple years ago when he was looking for a running mate. I said, if you offer the job to Netanyahu, I bet he'd take it with one small condition, that he'd also be allowed to keep his current jobs <laughs> as Israel's prime minister, foreign minister, communications minister, and minister of regional cooperation. After all, what does the vice president do anyway? About as much as Israel's minister of regional cooperation. Not much. And so, look, you, you could have had a Trump and Yahoo ticket what you ended up with is not all that different. Trump sees Netanyahu as a mentor. Uh, Trump, who does not really respect the Republican establishment in the United States, learned how to be a Republican from Netanyahu, his rabbi. Um, Donald Trump's uh, son-in-law, uh, Jared, has uh, seen Netanyahu as a mentor for many years. Well, the uh, experience that changed his life was going on a program called March of the Living that takes you to, uh, as a high school students, to Auschwitz and then the Western Wall. Uh, and that year, the speaker on the, on the trip was Netanyahu. And uh, the Netanyahu and Kushner families became close when Netanyahu came to New Jersey. He stayed in the Kushner family home in Jared's bed without Jared. You know, Jared went to the basement. <laughs> I have a, a good friend who uh, a year and a half ago had Shabbat dinner at the home of Jared and Ivanka in New York. And he asked her, does your father come for Shabbat dinner? And she said, yeah, every couple months he comes. He likes to see his grandchildren sing the Shabbat songs at the table. And he asked her the big question that you've probably always been wondering, which is, when Donald Trump comes over for Shabbat dinner, what happens between the washing of the hands and the eating of the bread? Between the washing of the hands and the eating of the bread in a traditional Shabbat table, 
You're not supposed to talk. Uh, she said he honors our traditions. He's very respectful. Ladies and gentlemen, we finally found a way to shut up Donald Trump. <laughs> so the people of Israel are undecided on Trump, uh, though uh, I think the views in Israel are changing. The people of Israel see both the positive and the negative. Uh, on, on the negative side, look, uh, they didn't like it uh, that he leaked Israeli intelligence to Russia. The Israelis on the right did not like that we're not building in settlements any more than we were under Obama. Israelis on the left don't like it that there's no peace process. And Israelis across the political spectrum don't like it that he broke his promise to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, look, there are people who said that that would cause World War III. Uh, I disagree. I think it would make uh, people throughout the region realize it pays to be an ally of the United States and that makes things safe. Uh, all you would end up doing is moving a, a sign from one building to another. Um, and look, there are a lot of capitals around the world that are clearly in the wrong place. Uh, Canada, Australia, Florida. You know, in Florida, they put the capital in the only ugly place in all of Florida. I must confess, uh, is it in Hartford? I don't know what your capital is in Connecticut. Okay, so he, he, here it makes sense. Albany, I don't really get. Uh, but Jerusalem, Jerusalem's been our capital for 3,000 years when Washington was a swamp. And we would have really liked it if he would have kept that promise. But Israelis see positive things too. Israelis heard him say during the campaign that from the moment he's elected, he will no longer allow Israel to be delegitimified, which is not a word, uh, but it sounded very good. And for the most part, he's kept that promise. Uh, we appreciate what Nikki Haley has done at the UN. Um, he's changing policies on Iran, which we appreciate. Uh, he had a very good visit to Israel, uh, which in the Israeli media was summarized by the following picture. Here we have Ivanka shedding a tear at the Western Wall, which is seen by Israelis as very sincere and by a majority of American Jews as not so much. Um, look, Israelis still like a lot that, that he has Jewish grandchildren. Um, not just Ivanka's three kids, but also uh, Donald Jr.'s five children are uh, considered Jewish by the reform movement. Uh, they have one Jewish grandparent, her father, and uh, that makes them uh, eligible for citizenship by the, the law of return in Israel and eligible for the birthright program. Um, the only grandchild that Trump has who is not Jewish by any of the religious streams is Eric's little baby. Um, and Tiffany, can't forget Tiffany, uh, Tiffany is dating a Jew too, because Jewish men are irresistible. <laughs> it's true. So uh, that's the people of Israel. Now we'll talk about Netanyahu. Netanyahu's mind is made up. And Netanyahu likes Trump a lot. Uh, this was my headline. Uh, the uh, right after he got elected. Uh, after Trump got elected in November uh, last year, the headline is, has Netanyahu won the lottery? Here they are looking all smiling together. The reason why I wrote that headline is Netanyahu never got along with the President of the United States before. Netanyahu never served with a Republican, being a Republican. Um, he uh, didn't serve with W, he served with Clinton, who the people of Israel liked, but the Clinton didn't like him very much. and. Uh, with Obama. Um, and so now he has an American president who he can work with. And I'm told that when you win the lottery, there are pluses and minuses. The pluses are pretty obvious, right? The minuses, you got to figure out what to do with the money. Netanyahu has a tremendous amount of credit in Washington. On Iran, we know what he's going to do. He's getting the deal fixed on the uh, Palestinian issue. It looks like they're going to have a regional approach to solving the conflict, they're going to have an economic approach to solving the conflict, and uh, we hope it'll work. The people of Israel are skeptical 
And the people of Israel, the last article I wrote before leaving on this trip was, has the Israeli taboo on criticizing Trump finally been lifted? Because at first, you know, people said that uh, we need to give him a chance and everything. And now it's been a year. And now people are, are uh, speaking very openly, uh, questioning. And that's something that can maybe bridge the gap between Israel and America that was very wide, between Israel and American Jews. Two different polls by the organization Pew, uh, one found that there are only three countries in the world where Trump has a very favorable approval rating, Russia, <laughs> the Philippines, and Israel. The other poll found that American Jews voted for him less than any other group in the United States. And so now that Israelis are, are more critical of him than ever, maybe that gap between Israel and American Jews uh, won't be as wide. We in Israel are not going to wait around for him to make peace in the Middle East. We've seen American presidents say before that they're going to do it. We in Israel are going to continue to thrive. We in Israel are going to continue to succeed. We're going to continue to have good lives, thank God. Our economy is doing very well. 4% economic growth, unemployment at a record low, tourism at a record high. Uh, this was a really fun summer in Israel. We had all the top music acts from America come. We had everyone from Britney Spears to Justin Bieber, uh, from Radiohead to Talking Heads. Uh, I went to Rod Stewart, I'm old. Um, before that, we had uh, Rihanna and Justin Timberlake a year ago. Uh, and so all the good ones are coming. The, the, the best seller out of all the concerts we've had in Israel over the last couple of years was Guns N' Roses. I don't think they're doing too well in America right now, but they're doing well in the land of Guns N' Moses. And so look, I hope and pray that things in Israel will continue to get better and better and better. And also for our neighbors, uh, the Palestinians and others in the region, and also for America. Thank you very much. The question is about legislation um, that are reinforcing Israel as a Jewish state, uh, rein reinforcing the flag, reinforcing Hebrew as the language of the, uh, of the state of Israel. These are all kinds of initiatives by members of Knesset who want to prove that they're more right-wing than their friends. Uh, in order to get reelected, it's very tough to get reelected in the Likud party because they have only a small amount of uh, seats that are open to incumbents. Um, and so these kinds of bills uh, that uh, stick a finger in the eye of the Palestinians, uh, some will pass, uh, that probably will, but um, won't change anything on the ground. Let me broaden your question to, to the entire fate of the Western Wall, not just as it applies to the women of the wall, because we're here at a conservative synagogue and, and people care about egalitarian prayer. Netanyahu made a promise, uh, made a deal with the religious streams that said that the current egalitarian prayer space um, that's on the southern wall would have an entrance opened up from the western wall, so when people would get to the western wall, they would have a choice between going to the men's section, the women's section, or the egalitarian section. Um, that agreement also gave the conservative and reform movements the ability to oversee that space, uh, which would have been the first formal recognition by Israel of a non-Orthodox movement. And Netanyahu, under pressure from the ultra-Orthodox, reneged on that deal. Um, Netanyahu sold out diaspora Jews in order to uh, find favor with the ultra-Orthodox, who he needs in his governing coalition. You have to understand, Netanyahu cares about war and peace. Netanyahu doesn't care about the Western Wall. Um, and in order to be able to control war and peace, because he doesn't have a majority of the vote on his own, he needs, it's easier for him to form a government with the ultra-Orthodox who don't care about war and peace than to uh, another party that does, that would dictate to him what to do. Um, and so he instead makes this deal with the ultra-Orthodox every time, except one. And that puts them in charge of matters of religion and state. And he's going to continue making that deal as long as the ultra-Orthodox control a disproportionate amount of power because they could form a government with either the right or the left. Now, the only 
optimistic thing I can tell you is that the ultra-Orthodox themselves are more divided than ever. Uh, the Sephardi ultra-Orthodox, uh, their Shas party, according to the polls that ran tonight on the nightly news, won't pass the electoral threshold. After one time having 17 seats, they're down to four. Smallest party in the Knesset has five. Um, and uh, they're going to have two parties at least among them. They're going to split their vote. They're not going to make it in. The Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox are vigorously divided not between parties, but to, between their party and the don't vote because that recognizes the state party. Those are the people who are closing down streets with protests right now, not, that are not about not serving in the army. They're already not serving in the army. They're about going to the induction center to receive the piece of paper that says they're not serving in the army because that would recognize the state. That's why they're sitting in the streets and singing and closing down traffic. Imagine that you're driving on a road and an ultra-Orthodox protest will break out and you can't move for six hours. I don't think that improves their PR very much. There was an article that people should read that it was in the New York Times out of all places in February uh, called A Settler's View of Israel's Future that uh, our mutual friend Yishai Fleischer, who has a radio show on the Land of Israel Network, wrote where he went through the various different uh, solutions that there are beside the two-state solution, uh, in order to explain maybe what uh, the President of the United States said when he said one state, two states, eight states, doesn't really matter. Um, there are a lot of ideas out there. Uh, there's ideas of confederations with Jordan and with Gaza being part of Egypt, um, where Israel would control the West Bank and Gaza militarily, but they would be under Jordanian and, and Egyptian civil control, there are ideas of having a, a one-state solution whereby Israel gives the Palestinians uh, certain rights, but the right to vote would have certain preconditions. Uh, there are ideas of having uh, many states with uh, the Palestinians being a very divided people, dividing them back by clan like the way they were before and letting them help self-government that way. Uh, there are all kinds of ideas out there. A majority of Israelis are still in favor of two states for two peoples. Uh, a lot less than were before because of the rockets that fell in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and the airport. That'll make people uh, less optimistic about being able to coexist. Um, but we have to keep in mind, we're not trying to coexist here. We're trying uh, to separate. Uh, that uh, I think our, our former finance minister, Yair Lapid, said it best. That. We're not seeking a marriage, we're seeking an amicable divorce. And that's harder, but it theoretically could be done. Uh, I define Israel, uh, peace as Israelis and Palestinians in Khamas together in public squares. Uh, that's not going to happen tomorrow or the next day. Uh, but I define Israeli, uh, a peace agreement as Israelis and Palestinians eating Khamas separately, which is a large security barrier in between. Uh, that theoretically could happen, and that could theoretically happen without even evacuating any people. Um, it would be very hard to evacuate four, four to 500,000 people from their homes. Even if you say we'd keep the settlement blocks according to what Ehud Olmert offered, you're still talking about uh, evacuating more than 100,000 people from their homes, and it was very hard to evacuate 8,000. So th these are all kept in mind when we're looking forward to the future. The question was, uh, whether Netanyahu is the force keeping all our enemies at bay. And uh, look, the IDF is the force keeping our enemies at bay. God is the force keeping all our enemies at bay. Netanyahu's name might mean given by God in Hebrew, uh, but uh, we'll go on without him. If he's indicted, somebody else will come. There are five former chief of staff of the IDF on the sidelines politically who are all waiting for the right time to enter politics, which is, of course, the last minute because uh, playing politics smart, the last thing you want to do if you want to obtain political support is speak. <laughs> uh, I would advise every budding politician to never, <laughs> sorry, to never do something that uh, would hurt your political career like actually give an opinion. <laughs> because it, if you do, people are liable to have a different opinion and, and then you lose support. And so that's what they're doing right now. They're waiting on the sidelines to be that white horse when uh, the time comes. And any one of them could also 
make us feel secure. And uh, so could Netanyahu's successors within the Likud party. The question was about whether there's any difference between uh, the leaders across the Israeli political map. They're all in favor of the same thing, of a regional approach to solving the Middle East conflict that would involve Israel basically evacuating nobody um, and getting a real peace in return, not only from the Palestinians, but throughout the Arab and Muslim world. It sounds nice. It's, whether it's feasible, I don't know. But that's what they're all in favor of. And I think it's not such a bad thing, we're at a, especially on a night that we're marking the anniversary of Yitzhak Rabin's assassination, when the right and left in Israel were so polarized and things were so tense. If to say that the Labor Party the Yesh in the center left, the, the Yeshatid Party in the center, and the Likud in the center right all say the same thing, the people of Israel have united. There's much more of a consensus than there's ever been. I, I think it's beautiful. We have a last question. If not, I will ask myself the last question. <laughs> people always ask me, what can I do to help Israel from where I live? And I tell people that helping Israel is easy. E-A-S-Y, which stands for education, advocacy, solidarity, and your money. And the ADL handles all of those things in a beautiful way. Um, we appreciate what they have done, particularly recently, uh, to protect uh, Jews from anti-Semitism uh, in Charlottesville and everywhere else. Um, and uh, I think that the recent events have proven that we need the ADL more than ever. So a uh, hundred year old organization, but uh, the anti-Semitism hasn't quite gone away. Uh, so as uh, congregants here, uh, I, I recommend you speak afterward to uh, Steve and to Jan, the nice folks from the ADL about how to be more involved. Thank you very much. <laughs>